nourishing your body and not starving it. And the whole focus with your health and fitness and fat loss and muscle gain program, it shouldn't be just losing weight. We want to focus on building the body stronger. So feeding the muscle so then you can thus burn the body fat with higher quality workouts, having more strength and energy. And it, it's not just the, the calories in, calories out equation. Welcome to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Podcast with Lee Hayward and Jeff Samataro. Since 1997, Lee Hayward's Total Fitness Bodybuilding has been online helping guys to build muscle, lose fat, and become the best version of themselves. The goal of this podcast is to provide you with real-world practical fitness and nutrition advice to look your best, improve your health, and feel confident in your own skin so you can live life to the fullest without having your body holding you back from doing the things you want to do. So if you're ready to get started, let's jump into the show. So today, what I want to do is, in addition to answering some questions and anything that you guys would like to discuss as you pop on to our live stream, I have a little presentation dedicated to nutrition, optimizing nutrition, because this is kind of like the Achilles heel, <laughs> the issue that so many people have when it comes to maximizing their fitness and fat loss and reaching their personal goals, whatever that may be, whether that is building muscle, losing fat, improving athletic performance, improving your health. Nutrition is the, the biggest challenge. Now, I'm not saying that the workouts don't pose a challenge because they certainly do, but nutrition is probably the biggest challenge for most. Hello, Mike. Hello. How's your day going for you? How's your weekend going for you? Pretty well. Hey, Sam, how's it going? Nice to see you joining into the group call. Yeah, hi. Yeah. How are you doing? Doing well, thanks. Hello, Bruce. Can you hear us? Test, test. Yeah, nope. how's it going? Today, I'm just going to share my screen here. Now I want to jump into some topics about nutrition. And uh, Mike, I, I'm going to use you as an example for some of this stuff because uh, <laughs> your past experience can really tie in nicely to uh, some of the things we were, we're going to discuss here. Is that coming through on your end, guys? That, that's yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> uh, Kareem, one of our members over in uh, Dubai, he was asking about nutrition and he posted this on our Facebook group as well. But one of the key things that he had a uh, concern with when we had our last coaching call together is he finds it difficult to meet his protein intake while still keeping in a calorie deficit. And he was wondering, like, if I'm short on the protein, should I go over the caloric intake for the day in order to meet the protein intake needs, or should I kind of just keep it all in a calorie deficit? So what's more important, hitting the protein intake or hitting the calorie deficit? For most of us, unless you are really overweight and you just are focusing on sheer fat loss, I would much rather you hit the protein intake than simply achieving a calorie deficit. And that's my personal opinion there. I would much rather see that. And I wanted to kind of address some of those key points there because I know uh, in, in Mike's case, when we started focusing on more frequent meals, more protein intake, I mean, your progress really took off and we'll... We'll discuss that in a bit more detail as well. So the big thing that I really want to focus on is the whole idea of nourishing your body and not starving it. And the whole focus with your health and fitness and fat loss and muscle gain program, it shouldn't be just losing weight. We want to focus on building the body stronger. So feeding the muscle, so then you can thus burn the body fat with higher quality workouts, having more strength and energy. And it, it's not just the, the calories in, calories out equation, because this has been debunked and, and there's been a lot of studies done on this with the whole idea of uh, G flux or energy fluctuation, where when you eat more, you actually burn more. And when you eat less, you burn less. And we see this with our non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And that's just the activity you do throughout the day without consciously being aware of it. If, if you're consciously aware of it, it's not neat. It's not non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Like I hear some people say, well, oh, I, I try and get up and walk more to get more neat. And I say, well, that's, that's technically not. That's actually exercise because you're purposely doing that. You're purposely expending energy. Uh, but the whole idea of uh, this neat non-exercise activity thermogenesis is when your body has adequate fuel you're more willing to just do stuff. You're more animated. You're more energetic. You're, you're running around. You're, you're doing things more. 
when you're in that calorie deficit, you're, you just slow down. And I mean, when you're in it for a prolonged period of time, I'm not talking about like, if you have one day where you're in a calorie deficit, but if you are in a prolonged calorie deficit, your body starts to go into survival mode and it actually shuts down non-essential activities and you try and conserve energy. And some examples of this, I mean, the, the big one that I've seen a lot when I was coaching um, competitive bodybuilders, especially female athletes, is in the, the weeks leading up to the contest, most of them would stop their menstrual cycle because that's a non-essential activity for the body. And when they go into that survival mode, when their body is in that extreme calorie deficit, it just starts shutting down all these other functions. So they're trying to, it's trying to conserve energy in every way possible. And we don't want to get into that. We want to try and keep it above that survival threshold where your body starts to shut down its, its energy burning. And we want to keep it running at high. You know, we want to keep the keep metabolism cranked up. So nourishing your body, not starving it. That's the key thing you really want to take away with. And I would much rather see someone get bigger and stronger and have more energy just versus hitting that calorie deficit and losing weight on the scale. Right. I mean, like, like in your case, Mike, when you were doing the carnivore diet, like energy wise, like, can you just share a little bit about that? No energy. Yeah. Okay. Without, the, without the carbs. I mean, it was just like, and then once, when we went to a, a more balanced diet, you know, my energy was there. It, it, it definitely was a difference. I mean, mm. it's been three years. I don't really, I can't articulate it really well on how, uh, on how low my energy was, mm. you know, and I was still pushing my way through, but there were times that it's like, yeah, God, do I have the energy to do this workout? And at that point too, I was only doing resistance bands. So it, it basically was one set of four or five exercises. So it wasn't as much of a workout as what I would, what I'm doing now. You know, so it wasn't this strenuous. Yes, I was trying to go to failure and all of that. But here again, it was one set to failure as opposed to a warm up set and then four or five working sets, you know, with 10 to 15 reps or, you know, whatever. If, if I tried what my workout now doing carnivore without carbs, I don't see it happening. <laughs> Oh. You know, it, it would not last long. And, and there and are that, times now, too, when I, I'll hit a wall and I, I'm finishing the morning workout and think, oh, my God, I have to do a workout this afternoon. I have no energy, you know, and I'll have my little Haribo, my, my gummy bears or maybe um, some uh, blueberries, a little bit more carbs during my lunch or right before I start the second workout just to give me that little bit of energy to, to push through. It mm -hmm. hasn't happened much, but it, I noticed that more when I first started dieting down January of this year. When I started losing some of the, the extra weight that I put on during my bulking time, um, mm -hmm. there was a, there was more than a couple of days that all of a sudden it's just like I had nothing in the afternoon. No, I appreciate you for sharing that, and that that's a prime example. Like you eat less, and your body just it burns less. There's less energy there. There's less of that reserve. The desire to power through a workout when you're well fed and well nourished. It's just not there when you're in that extreme calorie deficit, and we want to avoid that. And I, I love how you're manipulating it. Like you're you're aware of it, you, so you're still in the deficit. But if you feel that it's okay, it's too low. Instead of just suffering through and oh, that's it, I'm on the diet, no no pain, no gain type of you know, man up, embrace the suck or whatever. All this phrases that a lot of people do. Right, you're willing to say okay. I'm going to have a little bit extra carbs, right? Even if it is, you know, in the case of gummy bears, I know like people think, well, geez, isn't that terrible? But you're having it right around that workout window. That's going to just be like dumping gas on the fire, right? Like that's just fueling that workout. Well, and the thing is a serving of gummy bears is only a hundred calories. It's 13 gummy bears and it's a hundred calories. And I forget, I can't remember what the carb amount is on it, but it's, um, it's nothing outrageous. It's is it 25 carbs? Because like there's four calories per gram of carbohydrate. 23, yeah, it's 23 carbs. Okay, so there's there's a little bit of, in the, in the gelatin or whatever that's in the gummy bear, there might be a gram of protein or something in there to make up and for the- I was going to say, there's two grams of protein. Okay, there you go. Because <laughs> four calories per gram of, of carbohydrate, and that's whether it's sugar, starch, or whatever, you have four calories. So you said right. you're 100 calories, so that's just shy of 25 grams. Right. Uh, which it, it's not much but that's a little tiny bit just to top up your blood sugar and makes you feel better whereas if you didn't have that 
you would be going into that workout feeling brutal. like it's, right. it's and you made a great point earlier too when you said about you yeah, put on more muscle and you burn more i added the phone disconnected meal. oh i added the fifth meal to my nutrition plan may 1st of last year and in the first month i dropped five pounds instead of bulking i was losing weight you know so even adding on that extra the, those extra calories it, you know it, it wasn't like i suddenly added weight to the body i actually dropped right and when you're eating more, I want you to focus on well-balanced nutrition. Now, there are situations where we can deviate from this, but overall, if you're going to increase your calories or add a meal or anything like that, try and do so in balance and proportion. Like keep equal ratios of protein, carbs, and fat. Like everyone's wondering, like, what's the best macro split? That's a good one to have. Like third of your calories from protein, third from, from fat, uh, third from carbohydrates. Now, when I say third, I'm not meaning thirds in terms of portions, because fat is twice as calorie dense as protein and carbs. To put some real numbers, if you're having 200 grams of protein, 200 grams of carbs, it's probably around 80 grams of fat, somewhere around there. I can actually do the math here on my phone. Uh, 200 times four, that's 800 calories from protein and carbs. If we were to get 800 from fat... It's 88.8 .8 grams of fat, basically. So yeah, approximately mm -hmm. 90 grams of fat, rounded off, right? That's well-balanced ratios. And try and keep it in that guideline for most of your meals. Now, as you become more advanced, we can manipulate those ratios depending on your activity level, how your body's responding. But this is a good general template to follow to get started moving in the right direction. And most people are going to make really good progress with this. The only time you would need to eat more carbohydrates, and that would be the wild card. I, I would keep the protein and the fats pretty constant. But if you wanted to uh, increase carbohydrates, that's if you're really active. So you're doing double day workouts or you're pushing you know, high volume training. Increasing that carbohydrate is going to fuel that energy demands. It's going to fuel those workouts. But the protein and fat, that should stay stable right there. Because you want the protein as the building blocks for building muscle tissue, the fat for the health and the hormonal aspects. Because if, if you go really low fat, your testosterone levels plummet, a lot of metabolic hormones, you get joint pain and irritation because healthy fat and those fatty acids, that's good for joint lubrication. There's so many health benefits to healthy fat intake. But again, we don't want garbage fat or excessive amounts of fat, as in processed foods and, you know, vegetable oils and crap like that we want good quality fat and again i just wanted to share as mike was acknowledging here this was mike's transformation in recent years and we got another transformation photo happening now in 2024 good but, lord look at that hair i know <laughs> <laughs> you, you got a fro going on there right like good <laughs> god <laughs> oh, dear. In 2020, like that was the starting point. And then, of course, 2021, that was after the, the the carnivore diet and the intermittent fasting. Works great from a weight loss point of view. But you said like the energy and the strength wasn't there. And, of course, the muscle mass wasn't there. Added in a well-balanced diet, started eating more frequently, eating more carbohydrates, having those well-balanced ratios. You started to fill out your frame in 2022. And then in 2023 just continue that actually increased your calories even more increased your training more and just, just eat more burn more and build more so it's, it's like we just ramped the whole process up and i mean even now you're you're bigger and then leaner again so i'm looking forward to to seeing the progress now especially as you dial it in for the competition and uh, looking at your pictures and stuff that you've been posting i mean you, you're basically contest lean now you just really need to dial it in yeah like, I've, everyone's going to have some stubborn areas and i know especially as you get a bit older and stuff like the loose skin and that and like i even had that when i made my comeback into the masters back in 2021 after a 10-year hiatus i had loose skin that wasn't there back when i was in my 30s you know when i made my comeback in the 40s like just that lower ab area there, there's no fat under there but it's just this loose thin skin is just there I mean, it was frustrating, you know, because you, you got that. And especially like if, if you're doing like a abdominal pose or whatever, okay, the abs look great, but right below there, especially when you're wearing bodybuilding posing trunks, which don't leave, <laughs> there's not much hidden away with that, you know, it, it kind of makes that more obvious. And, you know, there's a few little stubborn areas you might want to tighten up or whatever, but 
overall, like your body fat level is definitely into the single digits, you know, regardless of whatever the caliper tests say. Yeah. You're down there. We're getting there. The thing I really want to drive home is I don't want you to try and go into some extreme deficit to think, oh, I, I need to step it up because I'm getting closer to the show. Like in your right. case, keep cruising on in. And if, if you can keep your strength and your muscle and that fullness into the show, you're going to look so much better. And also just allow that skin to tighten up a little bit more. Of course, at 60, there's not it's not going to have the same elastic and tightening responses if you were in your 20s or 30s. But it's still, if you keep the body fat off, your skin will naturally tighten up and thin out even more. And it most definitely has over the past, you know, couple of years from when I started. Slowly, it, there's changes, you know, and you know, and I just know it, 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 it is what it is. I'm 60, for God's sake, you know? Okay, we can deal with a little loose skin. Yeah. No. Considering where I was. The big thing in your case too, Mike, is, is once you started on your fat loss journey, it's been... Pretty much a steady drop in, in body fat. And I, I know like over the past winter, you did do a, a a lean bulk, if you will, where you filled out your frame a little bit more. But it wasn't a massive weight gain. Like there wasn't the yo-yo dieting fluctuations that you see. A yeah. lot of, you know, they're going up and down 50 pounds or something like that. Like that's what I would do back in my heyday of bodybuilding. I'd very often peak out in the 240s in the off season and then diet down to the 190s for contests. Yeah that up and down up and down like you're you're like blowing up a balloon and then letting the air out of it again and the skin right. sometimes you get away with it if you got a youth on your side you know some people's skin is more stretchy and uh, can bounce back but after a while it's <laughs> it ain't bouncing back the same but if you can keep lean and keep that body fat under control and of course keep your weight more stable so there's not the big spikes up and down in between right fat loss in, uh, in the off season, you can certainly uh, maintain a tighter physique all around. You know? So again, to really drive this home, like we want to do a deep dive into some nutrition. The big thing, if, if you're trying to meet your protein intake needs while keeping your calories uh, in check, you need to focus on lower calorie protein sources. So here are some of my personal favorites. Chicken, chicken breast that is, boneless, skinless chicken breast, Egg whites and whole eggs. Uh, I do a combination of both, but for me, I always have more egg whites than whole eggs. And a lot of people ask, you know, why, why, why eat the just egg white? Isn't all the nutrition in the egg yolk? And I say, yeah, all the nutrition is there in terms of like the the vitamins and the minerals and things like that. But that's where all the fat is too, and that's where the bulk of the calories are too. So if you want to kind of keep your calories and fat lower and keep it in check and, and more balance you need to have egg whites as well as whole eggs. So for me, I usually do maybe one or two whole eggs per cup of egg whites. So if I'm scrambling up like an omelet, I'll put in one cup of liquid egg whites, maybe one to two whole eggs. So I'm still getting the nutritional value of the whole egg, but there's a lot more lean protein and more volume with less calories than if I scramble up, say like six whole eggs. How do you do it, Mike? Do you eat eggs? No, I have eggs for every breakfast. Yeah. 12 ounces of liquid egg white. And I get it at Sam's Club. But egg whites are a phenomenal lean protein source. Because, I mean, very low in calories. Like one egg white has 17 calories. Zero fat, zero carbs. You know, it's, so it's your pure protein, basically. Whereas a whole egg, 70 calories. You know, six grams of protein, five grams of fat. So... If, if you're trying to meet your protein intake through whole eggs, you're, you're going to be way too high on the fat intake because it's almost equal ratios of protein to fat. And as we mentioned, fat is twice as calorie dense or more than twice as calorie dense. So if you're meeting your protein intake through whole eggs, your fat intake is more than double. It, it's, it's going to bump you into a calorie surplus and that's going to make it harder to lose body fat. Again, this, this isn't about health. Like a lot of people are thinking, well, aren't, aren't they healthy? Well, you can still get fat eating healthy, right? You know, you got calories in, calories out at the end of the day, right? We got to factor in that, if, especially if your goal is to improve in your body composition. Uh, another one there, fish. Fish is phenomenal from a protein source, but fish varies a lot because you have leaner fish. Like salmon is one of the fattier fishes. 24 grams of protein, 10 grams of fat in a typical serving of salmon. Whereas if you had a halibut or tuna or cod or shrimp, you're still getting the same protein, but now you're only getting a fraction of the fat. So if you want to get your protein from fish and keep the calories in check, 
try and choose some of the the white fish or the leaner fish more often. Not saying that you can't have salmon because it is a good source of healthy fat. You can have it in moderation for sure. But I wouldn't try and meet your protein intake needs through salmon alone or whole eggs alone or anything like that. Because again, it's just too high in fat. Same with beef, right? Beef's another great one, but beef varies a lot <laughs> depending on the cuts, right? Here's a little chart there. I mean, you can search this on Google yourself, but try and choose the leaner cuts of beef, right? Sirloin or top round or eye of round, stuff like that is pretty lean. Once you start getting into, uh, you know, the, the fattier, like T-bone steaks and the ribeyes and all that, you're getting into some pretty fatty cuts of meat there. And the, the fat is going to certainly bump the calories up. Now, I mean, yes, it tastes delicious. It's great grilled up and everything else. I totally get that. But if you're looking from improving your body composition, you want to choose the more often. And of course, protein powder is another great one. Pretty much all protein powders are going to be high in protein and low in fat. The types you use, it really depends on what you have available, your personal preferences. I, I, the one that I, I've used this one that I have just here in the pictures, uh, Premier, that's actually a good one. I find it tastes good, mixes good. Never had any issue with that. Uh, the one that I use primarily is Canadian Protein. It's a bulk company. I mentioned that numerous times on our show. What ones do you use, uh, Mike? What's some of your favorite protein powders? I, I'm not presently using any protein powder. I'm just eating whole right. food. Mm -hmm. um, but when I did, I would use Dimatize brand, the Dimatize yep. ISO 100. One time I was up at the lake house and ran out and Amazon was going to take a couple of days to get there. So I bought a can at Walmart and I don't remember what brand it was, but uh, I think two scoops and the rest of it went in the trash because it tasted so bad. And it was vanilla. It wasn't some weird flavor. It was just like supposed to be the vanilla. And it was horrid, absolutely horrible. And it was like $25. So it, it wasn't as expensive as Dimatize, but it wasn't cheap either. And I mean, $25 literally went straight in the trash can right. with maybe two servings out of it. And I've also used the ones that are packaged in foil packets, single serving from vitamin shop that are made by body body tech i think it is and th those mix up well they have a nice flavor to it and they're very convenient for traveling so you can throw them in a suitcase and mm -hmm. you know 12 12 packets take up no space in a suitcase and then just yeah. like, take a blender bottle and you know there, there you go you have it so it's super easy that way yeah if the pre-packaged ones it's great for traveling i mean obviously you when you're buying them you're paying for the packaging so as your daily source of protein, it's better to buy a big bulk container of it versus the pre-packed. Um, but yeah, I can certainly relate to what you're saying there. I've I've done the Walmart thing when I've traveled before, just picked up whatever different brands. I thought the one that I did last from Walmart was actually their own brand, um, Equate brand protein powder. And mm -hmm. I said, oh, it was a good deal, whatever. It was the cheapest one on the shelf. And looking at the, the nutritional profile, I mean, it's, you know, okay, it's it's high in protein, it's low in fat, low in sugar, everything else. Yeah, okay. But the stuff mixed like cement. I mean, it, it was, and it sat on my stomach just like, oh, I, I felt so gassy and bloaty and this is not good. That was the first and the last uh, that I ever tried. You do very often get what you pay for with protein powder. And if you do have a sensitive stomach when it comes to stuff like this, it's better to try some sample packs or at least some small containers to find out what you can tolerate, what you enjoy before you go and invest in a, you know, a big 10 pound bucket of protein powder or something like that. Try it out with some small ones. And a lot of times you go to the supplement stores, you know, whatever the GNC or the vitamin shop or supplement King in Canada, there's different ones we have here. You go to some of these uh, supplement stores and very often they'll have sample packs to give out and you can try it and see if, if it sits well with you or you enjoy it. I'm looking at Walmart's website. The one that I did not like, I think, based, I remember the can was black and orange, I think was Body Fortress. It's called Body Fortress Super Advanced 100% per, uh, Premium Whey Protein. And it was vanilla. And it got four and a half stars on there, but it didn't get four and a half stars with me. <laughs> Two thumbs down. It was terrible. And again, there is probably getting high stars because it was, you know, some of the cheaper ones or whatever, but. Yeah, it's on sale right now for 20 bucks for the can. So it's much cheaper than than Dimatize. The other thing with Dimatize is I have used the ISO 100 and I've used the casein mm -hmm. um, as well. Same flavor, the cinnamon toast or cinnamon bun or cinnamon something or another. 
you could not tell the difference in the flavor. It like it wasn't one was good and one was not so good. They they absolutely tasted exactly the same. So they're very consistent in the flavors. Um, and I would just do the casein powder at night. And for anyone who's wondering what's the difference, whey protein is a fast absorbing uh, protein. Casein is the slower absorbing. They're both dairy protein. They both come from milk, but whey is is the faster absorbing of the two. So the idea behind that is in the nighttime when you want to have that steady release of protein in your system, casein would be ideal for that. If you want faster absorbing protein, then the whey is ideal for that. If you're just going to get one or the other, I would just go with the whey protein because solid food protein is naturally a slower digesting protein, especially, you know, if you're, if you're eating chicken or meat and fish and things like that, that takes a while to break down and digest in your system. So that's naturally slower releasing. Uh, the whey protein is faster releasing, but if you wanted to buy a slow releasing protein, then the casein is the one for that. Hey Lee, a, a quick question on proteins there. Um, I saw someone on Facebook a couple of weeks ago, they were trying to sell some that they had bought and they were, they listed it as a uh, all whole food ingredients. Like it wasn't whey, it was like fish and chicken and other stuff. Like what's, what's your take? What's your thoughts on that kind of stuff? It, it was quite pricey to be honest. I've I've seen some of those ads for these whole food proteins or whole food protein bars and stuff like that. Uh, personally, I haven't tried them. And, and the reason for that is, as you mentioned, the, the cost is like, it's kind of deterring me from, from trying it. And um, I have a, a whey protein that's providing me with good quality protein supplement at a reasonable price. And it sits well with my stomach. I eat whole food protein anyway. So I, I just don't see the point in going and buying it. If you were making up a good chunk of your food intake from that, from protein powder, I mean, maybe you want to look into it. But for me, a protein powder is just a supplement. Like it, it it's, it's truly is a supplement, meaning I'm not trying to hit my protein intake needs through protein powder. I'm getting 80% of my protein intake through solid food. And the protein powder is just kind of like topping me up. I used to do the same with, as Mike is doing, like when I was getting ready for bodybuilding shows, sometimes I just go solid food entirely because there's a lot more eating satisfaction, eating real food than drinking a shake. If you want to keep your appetite in control and feel more satiated, eating solid food is way better to go. So I, again, I don't have any feedback to share on these whole food protein powders. I, I haven't used any myself. And quite honestly, I don't know anybody personally who has either. Right. And I think the price is a big deterrent for a lot of people. Yeah, it, it definitely deterred me. <laughs> I, go, I do go for the more affordable brands myself, whether it's Costco or Walmart or Superstore. And I'm definitely not a picky eater, so I'll choke it down if I paid for it. But I, I can attest that I've got a protein right now. And it, it's weird. Like the first 30 seconds, it seems like it mixes in. And then all of a sudden the protein just clumps up and I get these big chunks of protein which like i said i just choke it down it's, it's macros and that's all that matters but um yeah i could definitely imagine that some of the brands are probably uh, a little bit worth more spending them spending the time to find one that you like obviously it's, it's a nice thing if it tastes good and it mixes good and you actually enjoy consuming it but if it makes me feel like upsets my stomach or makes me feel gassy or bloated or any discomfort afterwards the that's the, the straw that breaks the camel's back like I'll choke it down too if it just because it doesn't taste good or I don't really enjoy it. If if I bought one, as long as it doesn't upset my stomach, it, it's going down the hatch. <laughs> I'm getting the, I'm getting the protein out of it some way, some shape or form. But if if I'm feeling bloated and gassy, I'm like, no man, it's not worth this. It's not worth the discomfort. That's what I found in some of the cheaper no name brands or knockoff brands or whatever. It's, sometimes that happens. And it can happen with, with some name brand stuff as well. Like, because you really don't know until you try it. Some proteins that I have tried and ones that I mentioned are, are good. And the nice thing, if, if you're looking for value protein, Costco has some of the best protein deals around. Now, granted, they usually don't have the hugest selection because, you know, obviously they got to buy it in bulk and make it worthwhile. But when I'm shopping around, they typically have some of the best values. If you're looking for a bang for your buck, that, that's where I go. Knock on wood, they've been carrying some good ones lately. Optimum Nutrition and some other good ones. And 
our Canadian Costco, they started carrying the the Canadian protein that I've been ordering online. They have it in stock now. So when I run out, that's where I'm going to get it from next. I ended up uh, getting a Black Friday sale on Canadian protein. <laughs> so I, I'm still using stuff that I bought from Black Friday. I bought up like whatever it was, six uh six five pound bags of it or something like that for a big old black friday deal so i'm i'm good <laughs> I, I still i still got a bag and a half left or whatever of, of that from from black friday so it got us to show like i'm not going through protein like I, I don't take it every day i'll take it most days and uh like for example this morning how i had my protein was just i put a scoop of protein in with a bowl of oatmeal for breakfast mm -hmm. so that, that's usually how i have it or throw it in with some greek yogurt and make a, a pudding throw it in with a blender smoothie i rarely mix up a protein shake anymore it's usually mixed in with some food or my wife likes to make high protein pancakes and she'll make up pancakes and literally put uh, vanilla protein powder in stir it up you don't even taste the protein powder well i mean it might have a nice little vanilla flavor but it doesn't to take away from the taste of the pancakes and harvey loves them so that's something he'll have quite you know several times a week he'll have high protein pancakes for breakfast uh, when it comes to carbohydrates, we want to do the same thing. Fill up on the low-calorie carbohydrates. And, and generally speaking, this is your just natural, unprocessed carbohydrates. Potatoes and sweet potatoes, if, if you're looking for filling, high-volume, satiating foods, they're two of the best. When you look at potato and sweet potato or anything like that, if anybody's getting fat because of potatoes, it's not the potato. It's what they're adding to the potato, whether it's the butter and the cheese or the gravy or or making French fries or something along those lines. But if you have just a, a baked potato or, or baked sweet potato or something like that, it is very low in calories for the amount of volume and eating satiation that you get. I eat those. I mean, like I'm full. Like you eat a, a big baked potato or a big sweet potato. I mean, it's it fills you up. Or you have that along with your chicken and your vegetables or something. I mean, you're not leaving the table hungry and you're still keeping the calories quite low overall, certainly low enough for fat loss. So those are two of my go-tos. Uh, oatmeal, that's usually a breakfast staple for me. Rice and pasta, those are good sources as well. They're a bit more on the calorie dense side, meaning you won't get as full from 50 grams of rice as you will from 50 grams of potatoes. Like if you're looking carb for carb. The rice is easier to eat and not quite as satisfying in terms of filling your belly and satiating. Not saying that it's a bad thing, but if, if you're trying to minimize uh, hunger, potatoes and sweet potatoes are probably your best bet. And oatmeal as well. Oatmeal is very filling and satiating. Like if you're eating 50 grams of carbs from oatmeal, you're full afterwards. For most people, a big bowl of oatmeal and put in a scoop of protein powder, like that's an all you can eat right there. Because you're going to be full. You're, you're not going to want to go back for seconds after you eat a big bowl of oatmeal. Uh, what other ones? Fruit, another big one. And fruit is a great source of nutrients, of carbohydrates. And anything goes. You know, like apples, bananas, oranges, peaches, cherries. Anything goes there when it comes to the fruit. I, I enjoy it all. I don't really have a preference. Uh, if you're going to go with bread, Ezekiel bread is a great one, i.e. sprouted grain bread. That's probably one of the better ones, but even whole grain breads are good. And of course, vegetables. A anything goes when it comes to the vegetables. Anything you want to add there? Like, how, how are you guys doing for uh, for carbohydrates? What are some of your favorite sources? Oatmeal, and, oatmeal is for breakfast. The second and third meal a day is a half a cup of white rice each time, half a cup cooked. And then I have sweet potatoes with dinner. Okay. So the, the fifth meal, I don't have any carbs with. But yeah, I've gotten to the point where I really do like sweet potato. And what I do is, and I don't bake it. Um, I get five ounces that meal. I, I may chop them into slices and cut them into sticks. Three minutes in the microwave is enough for five ounces. It's like no time. Very quick and convenient that way. Yep. Yeah. And fruit, um, I have uh, blueberries with my oatmeal. And then I've been snacking some uh, on blueberries and cherries at night. Cherries are excellent for snacks. Get the real cherries, not the ones that are coated in sugar and everything right. else. But real cherries with the pit in them, it, like it automatically forces you to eat slow because you, you've got to chew the cherry and get the pit out and spit the pit out. Yep. So it paces you. You just can't pop cherry after cherry and gulp them down, right? you got to pace yourself to get the pit out. So 
it, it fits the eating slow habit and it's a great snack food for sure. If if you're looking for toppings to go on uh, rice and potatoes or whatever, salsa is, is one of the better ones because it's yeah. basically chopped up vegetables and spices. Uh, hot sauce is another good one. If, if you can tolerate sodium, soy sauce is and mustard, things like that is great. You can get low sugar barbecue sauces, you know, like a lot of, there's a lot of different brands of low sugar sauces, but you want to be careful of what you put on your food because that can make or break a meal in terms of having it be a nice fat burning meal or a fat storing meal. Oh, we had chicken and, and potato and we had steamed broccoli, but okay, if that chicken is drowned in barbecue sauce and the potato is drowned in butter and the broccoli has got butter and cheese or whatever, like... Okay, you, you still had your chicken, your potatoes, and your broccoli, but it's not a fat-burning meal anymore. So what goes on the food can make or break it. So you want to be careful there. But uh, salsa, it, it's you look at like how many calories are in a serving of salsa, it's, it's next to nothing. Like You can pretty much eat as much as you want within reason and add flavor to your food. Same with hot sauce. Like if anybody, if, if you love hot sauce, go nuts with it. I mean, that adds a lot of flavor trace amounts of calories uh, mustard is another one you know if, if you like that again look at what it is like if it's a honey mustard that's loaded with sugar okay that's different but if you're actually just getting even like the plain yellow mustard or a dijon mustard or something like that that's trace amounts of calories yep. one thing that they uh they serve in camp that we've been having a lot when, whenever we have beef and stuff is uh horseradish and oh, yep. horseradish is pretty pretty low in calories i think it was two tablespoons of 20 calories or something you just load it up and adds a lot of flavor and i mean and, and again trace amounts of calories another one that i like to have too it's sauerkraut like get organic sauerkraut mm. adds a lot of flavor oh, yeah. it's a lot of good uh probiotics there for your gut so it's good for gut health but it's so low in calories and it adds extra volume to to a food and extra flavor so i mean you know have your your meat and your starch and your veggies and then like if you want horseradish or sauerkraut or something like that to go along with it it's a great way to add some extra taste to a meal another good one too mushrooms and onions and peppers like you can stir fry that up either like just get some nonstick spray in the pan and stir up mushrooms onions and peppers or a little tiny bit of a uh, cooking oil like be conservative with the oil. A little goes a long way. Those are foods that can add a lot of flavor and enjoyment and fill you up, right? Like stir up a big pan of mushrooms, onions, and peppers and have that. Like when I'm making an omelet, for example, like I usually do that first, then put the eggs in with it and get this nice big omelet, throw in a handful of spinach on top of it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a meal, but it's very low in calories. Like it's a big hearty meal. Next up, fats. We want to include moderate amounts of healthy fat, but as I mentioned, a little goes a long way. So some of my favorite, avocado and avocado oil. This is what I've been using lately as my cook spray. I know Costco sells these, instead of like Pam spray, they got their avocado spray. Have any of you used that before? Avocado oil spray? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what I've been using lately. And I find it's, it's equivalent to Pam. I mean, it's, it works just as well, but it's a little healthier because Pam oil is just vegetable oil or canola oil or whatever, whereas avocado, at least it's a healthier oil. Uh, olives and olive oil is good. The only thing with olive oil, it's not a high heat oil, so it's not ideal for, for cooking. But if you want to add a little bit to like a salad or or just eat the olives, like I, I just enjoy snacking on olives. So that's a nice little treat and i find that that adds a lot of flavor but again it goes a long way you want to be careful with that nuts same thing like walnuts almonds brazil nuts those are some of my favorites uh, brazil nuts very high in selenium walnuts good source of omega-3s uh, almonds those things uh, chia seeds sometimes have those too those are good healthy fats and of course, and then you're, a lot of times you're going to get your fat from your protein food as well, especially if you're eating fatty fish like salmon or mackerel or herring, something like that. You're getting your whole eggs, your beef, you're going to get some fat there. So you may not need to go out of your way to add fat to a meal, depending on what it is that you're having as your protein source. Like if your protein source is salmon, then you all right, you got your fat base is already covered. Or if you're having a steak for your meal, your fat is already covered from the steak. You just be, be cautious and mindful of it. Most people, we have to conserve the fat, but 
with with bodybuilding there's always the all or nothing like some people go the extremes like oh i'm having like zero fat and that's not healthy we want to have some moderate fats in there so if you are a very strict restrictive diet make sure to include some healthy fat in there because i've gone to the other extreme in my cutting days getting ready for bodybuilding shows where it was literally the boiled chicken and broccoli so like there was no real fat sources there at all and i found like you feel like crap after a while and not only that you get aches and pains in the joints because fat is that natural joint lubrication like you need that just to, to maintain good health in general but mobility and stuff and i found if you go super low in fat for a prolonged period of time you very often get a lot of aches and pains also supplementing too like i supplement with fish oil high potency fish oil supplements to make sure that i am getting my omega-3s Again, Mike, I'm going to ask you, how, how are you handling fat intake now that you're keeping the calories lower for, for fat loss? Most of mine comes from red meat. I have hamburger every morning for breakfast, just a small amount. So I, I do get it that way. And then I usually have a red meat for dinner. And occasionally I'll have something like olives or a, a, an egg that has the egg yolk in it, but not, not too frequently. Oil, I will use olive oil every now and again. I guess that's about it. I, cooking spray, I normally use just Pam. I don't like avocado, so I don't think I would be using avocado. Or I don't, I'm, not, I'm just not a big avocado fan. Guacamole is okay, but yeah, avocado toast, yeah, you're never going to see me eating that. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's mostly from red meat is where I'm going to be getting it from. Mm -hmm. Do you supplement with any uh, like fish oil capsules or anything? I do, like um, do the omega-3 pills every morning. Mm-hmm. I usually have them with my breakfast and with my evening meal as well. Like that's, that's the way I do it, just to kind of space it out. And like, if you look at the bottle of omega threes, you usually say like one capsule a day or or whatever. Like, you can take a lot more than that. Like, if you're having a meal of salmon, there's almost like a small handful of capsules in terms of like the amount of fish oil fat that you're getting from a fillet of salmon. I'll usually take say like three one gram capsules in the morning and three one gram capsules in the evening. Now. It's optional like try it out. If, if you've never taken fish oil capsules before, just literally start off one at a time. See how they react to your body because sometimes people find that they, they get the fish oil burps <laughs> until your body becomes adapted to it. But I've never had any big issues with it. Uh, the ones that I get are from Costco, the Kirkland's brand, which are a high potency fish oil. And the thing you want to look at with fish oil is the percentage of DHA and EPA versus the total fats. Is this coming up on your screen? Can you see this? Yeah. Yep. Okay, I just want to make sure that so sometimes when I'm sharing my screen, what I'm seeing is not what you're seeing. <laughs> right? So I want to make sure that. But this is the the one that I use, their omega-3 fish oil. It's actually 1200 milligrams per capsule. So it's they're, they're big capsules. Uh, and there's 500 milligrams EPA and 250 milligrams of DHA, which are the omega-3 fatty acids. So when you're looking at the total volume, that's more than half the thing you want to watch out for is some of the uh, the cheaper brands, like you go get the, the no-name brand or the drugstore brand or whatever. It says omega-3 on the bottle, but when you actually look at the ratios, it's probably like 10% omega-3 fatty acids and the rest, the other 90% is just garbage fat that you don't need. You want to make sure that you're getting a minimum of 50% or even ideally 60 or higher percent of the actual omega-3s, right? And again, that's the EPA and DHA. And anything else, I think. Oh, and the, the last thing that I want to cover here is the big one we need to avoid. I've told you all the stuff that we want to include, but the big ones we need to avoid are the processed foods. I think this comes pretty straightforward, but it still blows my mind the number of people who are health conscious and still say they're health conscious and still end up eating a lot of this stuff on a regular basis, justifying it by saying, oh, it's my cheat day or it's just a treat. I'll get back on track on Monday. Yeah, about it. It all adds up, right? You want to keep this stuff to a bare minimum or if, if you can avoid it, avoid it. And like with the soda pops and the, the sugary drinks, at least go with the diet version. If you do enjoy soda or you do enjoy like the sugary drinks most of them now come in a sugar-free variation so if you do want that sweet drink go for the sugar-free option and i know some people say well i don't like the taste of the sugar-free i like the regular one and i just say well do you like being fat do you like having high blood sugar do you like being diabetic right learn to like diet soda this is a small swap to make for the, your overall health and fitness 
either either learn to give it up entirely or make a swap for a healthier alternative. Another one that I want to address too is when it comes to some of the processed foods, a lot of people say, well, well we make our own cakes and cookies and stuff. So it's homemade. It's not store-bought. You know, it's, it's still loaded with sugar. It's still loaded with butters and oils and fat. So, I mean, okay, it might be a healthier, less processed option, but from a a fat loss point of view and a calorie point of view, it's it's still just as fattening as the store-bought stuff. So don't use the, oh, I, I'm eating homemade cookies as your justification for eating cookies. I, one of the guys in our group, right? I'm not going to mention names, but he that was his thing. He, he had his um, vegan oatmeal raisin cookies. And because they were vegan and because they were oatmeal and raisin and because he made them himself, he said that was like a free-for-all thing. And I'm like, it's still a cookie. Right. Whether you're going and getting cookies at the store, like calories in, calories out. And when someone says something is vegan, sometimes vegan foods are worse than the real foods. Like you look at these vegan meats, these beyond meats that they have there, like beyond burgers or impossible burgers or whatever they are. There's more processed crap and more fat and preservatives in that than there is in a, a regular ground beef burger. <laughs> it's not a healthy option because they like to stamp vegan on the, the label. You know, just be aware of that, right? Junk food is still junk food, right? We want to be very mindful of that stuff. All right, so here are a few takeaways that I want to share here. For general guidelines, eat a well-balanced meal every three to four hours throughout the day. Try not to go longer than four hours without eating something. Because once you're going longer than four hours, your blood sugar is going to start to crash. And yeah, you may get away with it for that feeding period, but it's going to catch up with you later in the day. And that's when very often people will end up eating the junk food or overeating in the evening because their blood sugar crashes. And then when they do start eating, it's like opening up the floodgates. It's very common for people to be overweight and say, well, I don't eat breakfast. I, I don't eat lunch, right? I don't know why I'm not losing weight. And I say, it's all the crap you're eating after dinner, <laughs> you know, in those late night snacks. That's what it is. People think that they're saving calories by skipping meals. But then they usually boatload and, and they can't control themselves in the evening. And then very often they'll justify making poor choices later in the day because I didn't eat anything all day. I deserve to have that slice of pizza. I didn't eat anything all day. You know, I deserve to have this candy bar, this ice cream, this whatever, those vegan oatmeal raisin cookies. <laughs> so eat every three to four hours throughout the day. Start early and get your nutrition in. And not only is this going to help you to meet your protein and nutritional intake needs, but it's going to stabilize your blood sugar and your energy. As far as the protein is concerned, we want to get at least 40 grams of protein per meal. That's a benchmark. I mean, obviously, the bigger you are, the more protein you need. But that's a good general guideline for most guys. Strive to get at least 40 grams of protein per meal. Right? If, if you're doing that, you're going to be on, on track to hitting your protein intake needs. Including veggies or fruit with every meal, whenever possible. I mean, I know it's not always possible, and sometimes I will have a, a meal that doesn't contain vegetables or fruit, but more often than not, they do. Uh, eat complex carbs based on your activity level. So when you're burning more, you can eat more. Uh, like right around that workout window, <laughs> have the carbs like in your pre-workout meal and your post-workout meal. If, if you're trying to maximize energy, minimize fat gain, timing your carbs around your workouts is the best way to do it and the big one that i want to emphasize as well do not let yourself go hungry if you're hungry eat because letting yourself go hungry and i don't mean just like a little bit hungry but like some people purpose to try and go fast and, and have these prolonged periods of hunger it usually backfires in the long term you might get away with it for the short term but then more often than not it's going to backfire and lead to binge eating later on so you're much better off to keep things stable just with a very slight deficit that doesn't feel painful versus trying to have this massive deficit where you're feeling hungry, feel like you're suffering, you'll sustain it for days or weeks before you end up going off the rails, binge eating. Do not let yourself go hungry. Keep the steady nutrition in there. All right. And another one that I want to address here as well, this was Kareem actually was asking questions about this. He was like, should he have a strict meal plan where everything is laid out or should he focus on habits? And both can work. I'm sure, Mike, like you have a meal plan. Like you pretty much know what you're going to eat meal by meal for the most part. Yeah. And even before that plan, we always planned meals for the week because that way we made sure we had the right food in the house for those meals. But 
more importantly, we didn't just go to the grocery store and say, oh, hey, look, there's something I hadn't thought about. Go to the grocery store hungry or whatever. So as long as we've been married almost 38 years, we have done weekly meal schedules. You might change them around, you know, whatever. But is, if I know what the seven days are, what we're planning, then we have that food in the house. We don't have to worry about it. And then we don't go out to dinner as much. We find if we don't have the scheduling of it, we tend to go out to dinner. And that, that's the, the pros of having a meal plan, for sure. I mean, it, it certainly works. It takes a little bit more effort up front. But in the long term, you'll probably save yourself time and, and a lot of headaches and frustration because you have that plan. The planning in advance certainly saves a lot of mishaps happening down the road. But with that being said, you can still make it work if you just focus on the nutritional habits. And the, the key thing, meeting your protein intake needs, meeting your carbohydrate needs, and meeting your vegetable needs. Good chunk of my plate is protein. Good chunk of my plate is carbs. Good chunk of my plate is vegetables. And I, I used to always recommend the one third ratios. And in this case, they got like half, half your plate is vegetables and fruit on this diagram here. But either way, however you look at it, as long as you're getting protein, you're getting carbs, you're getting vegetables with each meal, natural on processed foods, making the best choices, you can get by with the habits. Like it doesn't have to be outlined meal by meal, food by food. Like as long as you focus on the habits, you can still make it work. This is what I use most of the time. But when I actually look at my habits, we are creatures of habit. And a lot of the meals are actually very similar day to day, week to week. You know, we, we go through the same set food choices over and over again. But I have the flexibility. You know, when I, may, maybe it's going to be chicken tonight. Maybe it's going to be beef. Maybe it's going to be fish. It really depends. You know, I'm very flexible in that case, especially now that it's summertime here. You know, I know I know a lot of people who are out fishing and stuff. So my neighbor might knock on the door and say, hey, I, I just caught salmon the weekend. Hey, would you like some? I said, yeah, absolutely. So there, that's, that's supper for the next night, right? Going to have some fresh salmon or some fresh codfish or whatever. So, I mean, we're very flexible in that sense, but it's still the same core habits, protein, carbs, veggies, protein, carbs, veggies, every meal and minimizing the processed foods. This is kind of depends on your personality. If, if you like planning in advance, you know, the meal plans, by all means do it. If you like going by the habits and that works for you, by all means do it. Like Mike's going by the meal plans. This is his results. It certainly worked for him. I went by the habits. And this was my results, and it certainly worked for me. Like this, this was not counting calories, tracking macros. This was just focusing on the habits as outlined in the Precision Nutrition. And this is how I made my transformation. I mean, Jeff went through the same thing. Jeff didn't count calories or track macros once he he understood them. Now, I want to clarify that because if if you'd never tracked your nutrition before, and you don't know how much protein is in chicken breast, how much carbohydrates are in a cup of rice. Like you've never ever tracked this and you just have no idea. You need to start getting some basic numbers and understanding, okay, this is a good source of protein. This is a good source of carbs. This is how much fat this contains. You know, you got to know the basics. But once you have those fundamentals in place, you can rely on the habits and still make it work. And the key thing is, are you making progress? If we're seeing visible changes with your progress, meaning there's visible changes in the pictures, there's visible changes in your measurements and your body weight and your strength and energy is increasing. If you're making progress, it's working. Like the goal is not to have the squeakiest, clean, strictest diet plan on paper. The goal is to get in shape. So however you do that, if that is a meal plan and you enjoy it and it works for you, go for it. If it's relying on habits and just focusing on, okay, as long as I eat protein, I have a good serving of carbs and I get my veggies, I'm good. If that works for you, and you're enjoying it and you're making progress, that's fine as well. Uh, I, the one thing that blows me away, and I've seen other coaches do this, is they get mad at their students if they deviate from their meal plan. Like I remember one of the guys who came on board with the program, he said he he checked in with his previous coach that he had, and he had a cheat meal that wasn't planned into the meal plan. But at the end of the week, he still dropped two pounds on the scale. His measurements were improved. Like everything was improving. But the fact that he had a non-planned cheat meal and his coach got mad at him, like instead of celebrating the fact that he made progress, he got mad that he deviated from the, the, the meal plan on paper. And like, I really don't care about the meal plan on paper. I care more about your actual progress because the, the meal plan on paper, that's just a, a template, a guideline to follow. It may not even be the ideal one. Like that's always a work in progress. It might be a rough draft that needs to be tweaked and modified as we go. 
the big thing is, are you actually making progress, right? Are we seeing visible changes? And if we are, that's, that's all that matters at the end of the day, right? The goal is not to have the perfect workout split and the perfect meal plan. The goal is to get in your best shape. And however you go about doing that, that's all that really matters. All right. So that's, that's what I've got, guys. If you have any feedback or suggestions, feel free to chime in. Just a quick question about the avocado oil. You said that, that that's good for high heat. That's safe for high heat. Yes, avocado oil, I believe, is good for high heat. I'm just actually going to double check on that, but I'm pretty sure it is. Coconut oil is really good for high heat. Avocado, I believe, is as well. Avocado oil has a smoke point of 520 Fahrenheit, making it great for high heat cooking. Yep, okay. So you could even deep fry with avocado oil. The, the only thing, uh, the olive oil is the one that has the, the low smoke point. Like, you could still cook with olive oil, but it's, it has to be low temperature cooking. You're not going to put it in a deep fryer or anything like that. You know, if, if you're just sauteing some vegetables at low heat or something like that, you, you certainly you can get away with olive oil, no problem. Coconut oil, avocado oil, those are some healthy high heat oils. One thing I was going to mention that we didn't talk about is trying to fill in your, your protein requirements of the day. Don't yep. rely on protein bars. Make sure you read those to, that... You know, some of them look like they have great protein and then you see what the carbs are and they're just so out of line that it's actually a carb bar, not a protein bar. And I've done that before where I, you know, I needed a few more grams of protein. So I made sure it was a Quest bar or a Built bar that had the right proportions. But th those um, uh, Gatorade ones were outrageous on what they were. Here, I'm just going to pop it open here on Amazon. Um, so here's the Gatorade uh, you know, right here. Protein, right? Uh, whey protein bar, 20 grams of protein. So, I mean, you're looking at that, well, that must be pretty darn good. Where's where's the nutritional information here on this? Probably better than a candy bar, but yeah, you really got to be careful well, with the macro. I, I don't even know about that. Let's open that up. So, 13 grams of fats, 41 grams of carbs, 29 are from sugar, and 20 grams of protein. So, there's more wow. sugar than there is protein. So, like, technically, it should be called a sugar bar. Yeah. yeah. Right? Right? I mean, if it's got more sugar than protein, it should be a sugar bar. <laughs> and even, even then, you're still getting more macros from the fat than the protein. Yeah. The, the, if you're looking at where's the calories coming from in this, it's mostly fat <laughs> and sugar. Yes, there is protein in there, but it's basically like visualize I, I'm eating a, a candy bar and I'm having a small protein shake along with it. Like that's basically what you're doing there. And, and that's basically what most protein bars are, but some of them are pretty decent uh like quest one yeah. brand i use is uh pure protein they've got it at walmart and costco yep. and, and it's it's mostly protein there's almost no fat and almost no carb depending on which flavor you select they've got one that one that's double chocolate and i think it almost has no no fat and almost no carb yeah we'll, we'll look into that one in a second now so the the only thing is a lot of them still are quite high in fat like quest bars you know nine grams of fat in this particular flavor um where is it? 16 grams of carbs, 17 grams of... Oh, is that, is that the one? Just a second, I got to move my screen here. Yeah, that is Quest Bars. Okay. So it's... But still, there's more protein than there is carbohydrates. So it's actually a true protein bar, right? That's the thing you want to look at. Here's the pure protein ones that you were talking about. How much... They got some of the sugar substitutes in there, but there's 18 grams of carbs, 20 grams of protein. So yeah, it, it is a protein bar and it's low in fat. The only thing that could be looked at as a negative with this one the ingredients soy protein isolate is one of the main ingredients now i'm not totally negative against soy protein like i i've went through phases where i've consumed soy protein on a regular basis and quite honestly i never had any problem with it and then i went through a phase where i was like oh soy protein is the devil it's going to cause all these estrogen side effects and i i actually made videos back in the day saying oh never consume soy protein I've never had any issues with it. You know, some people say the isoflavones, it releases estrogen into the body and stuff. I mean, you probably have to consume a shit ton of soy protein to make that work. I, I mean, back when I was younger, my first protein powder that I ever used was soy protein. And I used that for years and I never had any issues with it. I can attest, I've got a buddy who's in his 60s and he got on soy protein way back in the 80s or whatever. And and he'd have his shake every morning. And when he got into his 60s there, he was really struggling to maintain body weight. And he was starting to lose mm -hmm. his body weight. And all we, all I did was I convinced him to switch to whey protein. He started using whey, and he was gaining weight. Like, But he 
was like muscle, like he was gaining like muscle and like noticeable difference in like six months, I think. And he basically stopped taking the soy because of that. And he found the way it was a lot better. Okay. Interesting. From the point of view that I'm sharing this as is I'm using protein powder and even protein bars and all this as a true supplement. Like it's, it's just an add on. It's not my main source of protein. So like, again, 80% of my protein is coming from real food, the, the bars and the shakes and the powders. That's only a, a small fraction of it. So when it's not a major chunk of your protein, it probably is not going to have a huge impact, but if you're getting a good chunk of your protein from supplements, it could have a noticeable impact. And I appreciate you for sharing that. So that's the only thing that I want to highlight with these protein bars. I mean, yeah, I know they're they're good ratios, but the, the primary protein source is soy, but it also has whey protein as well. So just something to, to take into consideration. That's why yeah. the, the Quest bars and the Built bars and stuff like that are more expensive because they are whey protein bars and mm -hmm. way more expensive protein than soy. Now, I, I found out too, on the Quest bars, you have to read the label carefully because the Quest crispy ones i think they're called are not as good no, nutrition wise okay they have some sort of a, a crispy coating on them or something mm -hmm. and i want to say it throws the carbs higher than the, the protein i i found out after buying one yeah there's there's quest has got a bunch of products out now i mean they've got the chips they got the peanut butter cups like the reese peanut butter cup ones which are delicious i will say those are good <laughs> they're, they're high in fat right like that's yeah. there they are right here the yeah. peanut butter cups but they yeah. Uh, they're low in carbs, you know, and everything else, but they're not saying how high in fat. Like there's, there's a, a lot of fat in those. Yeah. Where is the nutrition on that? I don't know. I, you know, better, better than a Reese peanut butter chocolate. View these as, as treats. Like these are just healthier s sweets, if you will. I mean, when I'm seriously pushing fat loss, I do not consume protein bars. Uh, that's one thing that I will cut out of my eating plan. And I even avoid the protein powder as well and just try and fill up on that natural unprocessed food when I want to maximize fat loss. When I'm not maximizing fat loss and I'm more, hey, I just want to maintain, yeah, I'll have protein bars. When I go on big cycling rides, I'll take cliff bars and protein bars with me because they're so convenient. If I'm trying to maximize fat loss, that gets cut out. Like when I did my bodybuilding show back in 2021, there was no protein powders. There was no bars. Like that was in the final, in the final weeks leading up to the show. Like I was able to get quite lean by having that stuff in there. Uh, but when I wanted to make the final push for going from lean to ripped, that got taken out of the equation. And I found it made a noticeable difference. Hopefully that was helpful, guys, and a good overview. And the big thing I wanted to just share this and have this posted to the group because there's a lot of fundamentals with nutrition that we need constant reminders of, right? Because a lot of this stuff, it's, it's basic, but you can't escape the basics, right? You need to have that drilled home. And once you start having all this in place, frequent meals, well-balanced ratios with your protein, carbs, and fats, keeping the processed foods to a minimum. I mean, once you have all those pieces in place, progress is pretty consistent, you know, people who are struggling, you know, they're on and off again with their progress and like, oh, I didn't lose any weight this week, didn't see any progress this week. If you go back and look at all these things, like, are you working out consistently? Is your nutrition meeting these guidelines that I just covered here? If it's not, that's probably the reason why the progress isn't happening. Once you get these pieces in place, it's very predictable. Like, it's it's not overly complicated. Like, I know in Mike's case, so I love using you as an example because you're very consistent, Consistent to the point where you can almost say it's boring. <laughs> yeah. I've said before, I feel like I'm on, I'm on cruise patrol, you know, which is nice. So I'm going to get ready and clue this up. And of course, in the meantime, if there's anything I can do to help you out, feel free to message me and we'll be in touch on our Facebook group. Cheers, guys. All right. Take care. Have a good one, guys. Take See ya. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Podcast. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the podcast. And if you know someone who could benefit from today's episode, please feel free to share it with them. I mean, if you could help us to spread the word, that's going to help to get this message out there and allow us to create more content like this and reach more people and just create that positive impact all around. And if you would like some help with your own fitness goals, you know, maybe it's building muscle, losing fat, improving your health, getting in your best shape. If you would like some help with that, then feel free to reach out to me. I have my contact information down in the show notes below. 
and you can book in for a free one-on-one -on -one strategy session coaching call with me, and we can discuss a realistic action plan that's right for you. And if I feel that you're a good fit, I may invite you to come on board and join our VIP coaching program. And if it's not a good fit and I feel that I'm not the right person to help you, then I'm not going to give you a hype or BS, but I will point you in the right direction to somebody who can help you. I mean, I've got a large network of people in the fitness industry. So if I don't feel that you're a good fit for our coaching program or that I can help you, I'll be able to point you in the right direction to somebody who can. So either way, at the end of your free strategy session coaching call, you'll walk away with better insights on what you need to do next in order to reach your health and fitness goals. So that clues it up for today's episode. And we'll be back again next Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time with another episode of the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Podcast. Take care. Over and out.